what is crop breeding, what are some of the new non-GM techniques that are available, and why is genetic modification fundamentally different to conventional crop breeding and some of these other biotechniques. Crop breeding is essential for food security, that's the first thing I want to say. Uh, without crop breeding, we would be starving in many places in the world more than are at the moment. We need to breed crops to adapt to the changing environment. We need to be breeding crops for improved yield. Disease resistance is a very important thing. New diseases are evolving all the time, and so it's an ongoing battle to breed new varieties to combat the new pathogens that are coming up. We need to be breeding for grain quality. Efficient nutrient use is an important thing. Um, the amount of phosphorus in the world is a very finite resource, and so we need to be breeding for more phosphorus efficient crops. Um, also, we need to be breeding for uh, stress tolerances for various uh, stresses, including salt and heat, um, and early plant vigour and water use efficiency. I wanted to illustrate that crop breeding is not a new activity. It's been going on since agriculture was invented. And each of those little figures up there uh, represents one generation of 25 years. And there's been 600 generations of farmers that have been breeding crops since agriculture was invented. You know, crop plants all came from wild species that were very small fruited and small grained. And ever since farming started, uh, people have been breeding better and better crops. Those little figures down the bottom there represent the last 100 years. And at the turn of the 20th century, um, Gregor Mendel's laws of genetics were rediscovered and that was the beginning of scientific plant breeding. Um, then about 50 years ago, back around the 1950s, with the invention of statistics and all those kind of modern techniques, modern plant breeding was invented. And it's really only the last 20 years where genetic engineering has started to impinge on crop breeding. Crop breeding basically involves two different plants. You're trying to combine characteristics between different plants. Um, so you start with one that might be disease resistant, one high yielding. You make a cross between the two, cross pollinate. Among the progeny, you select in the field and you'd be selecting among thousands and thousands of plants. Next. Um, and this involves recurrent selection for 10 or 12 generations. Now the problem with conventional plant breeding, uh, two problems. One is it takes a long time, it takes 10 or 12 years to breed a new variety. And the other problem is finding new sources of genetic variation. Um, you know, when new diseases turn up that attack crops, where do you find the genes that are resistant? And um, genetic engineers will tell you they'll invent one, but there are other ways. Microspore culture involves taking immature microspores and um, pollen grains or microspores have only half the genetic complement of the plant. It's like any sexual reproduction, the egg and the sperm each have half the genetic complement. By generating plants from pollen grains, we can speed up the time of breeding a new variety by three to five years. And so this is a very valuable technique that's been developed over the last 10 to 15 years, and it's used in wheat breeding and barley breeding here. We're trying to develop it for oats and pulses as well. The next technology of molecular marker technology, now that picture there is a, a slide of chromosomes, which the genes are on, genes are on chromosomes, and they're in a specific order on the chromosome, and this is just an example of one chromosome. Maybe there's a gene for height or virus resistance or vigour, etc. on that chromosome. Now, DNA markers, they're called markers, but they're basically bits of DNA that are tags so that you can follow the genes through the generations in the breeding program. And this is a really valuable molecular biology technique that can be used to speed up breeding programs. Now, interspecific hybridisation is a way of getting genes from other species. So this is an example using barley and hordium bulbosum. Bulbosum is a wild barley and there's lots of useful genes in there that we are trying to incorporate into barley. You can't just cross um, between species like that and get viable seed. You, there's a trick involved. You need to um, surgically remove the embryos and culture them in vitro, but then you can generate um, viable plants. And that's a really useful way of introducing uh, genetic variation from other species. Now, I just want to illustrate here that this has been a very useful way of introducing rust resistance into wheat. And this is just a list of all the wild species that have been used to generate rust resistance genes in wheat that are used in our commercial wheat varieties today. So it's a, it's a really important technique. 
genetic engineering is not an extension of traditional crop breeding. We often hear this, oh, genetic engineering is just the next step uh, in traditional crop breeding, and it's not true. Traditional breeding, you can't get a gene out of a rabbit or a fish or a fungus or a human being and put it into a plant. That's a fundamental difference. Now, in a genetically engineered gene, those little bits are taken from different organisms. You might get a bit from a virus or a fungus or a plant or a, or a human and sew them together and then put them into the plant. That's fundamentally different. It doesn't happen in nature. When you genetically engineer a crop, that little red triangle just illustrates a, a gene that you might have introduced into the crop. Now, it goes randomly into the chromosomes. And sometimes there are multiple copies that can go in upside down. And so the gene that you think you're putting into the plant is, in fact, not the one you, you think because it changes when it goes in in different ways. So it's a very unpredictable process and often generates unpredictable proteins and unpredictable results. The other thing that's important that's not often talked about is glycosylation, which means, you know, genetic engineering is in introducing new proteins into plants, but the thing about proteins is they're often associated with sugars. Uh, it's quite common. And what we often find is that when you introduce a protein, a genetically engineered protein, into the crop, uh, it combines with different sugars to what you expect. And those sugars can have different immunogenic effects on people that consume them. So that's an important issue that's often overlooked. Is this just a summary of all those points?